Hey, what's up, you lot? Path here, and today I want to talk to you about what I think, I think, is the straightest line that's been measured to date. Now, there may be examples of even straighter lines, and if there are any examples that you can think of, then let me know down in the comments below, because I'm really interested. I want to know if there are any lines that have been measured to be straighter than the one I'm going to be talking about in this video. But I think the line that I'm going to be talking about today is about as straight as it gets. And because I'm a physicist, this is not just a line that somebody sat down and drew and then measured it to see if it was a straight line. No, 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 none of that. I am going to be talking about some frankly astonishing results found in a scientific experiment. The data points when plotted on a graph and joined up in a dot to dot fashion form a remarkably straight line. All of the measured points have exactly the same value to within one part in one billion. Basically this line, right? This line is straight AF. So without further ado, let me actually get into explaining what this line is and stop actually just telling you that I'm gonna be telling you about the straightest line. Let's go. Now remember, because this is Path G's channel, in order to understand this straight ass line, we're first going to need to learn a little bit about some interesting physical phenomena. But before we begin, I have to tell you that I try and explain this phenomena so literally anyone can understand them. I don't care if you study physics to undergraduate level or if you stopped learning it after high school. And I genuinely think that if I've done a good enough job of trying to explain this concept, then you can understand it. However, these are extremely advanced concepts. Like this is stuff that I learned in my third and fourth years of university. So my final year of my undergraduate degree and my one year of my master's degree. And for this reason, it might take a little while for the concepts to fully settle in. And additionally, you won't get the full gist of it, mathematically speaking. I'm not gonna be discussing the detailed maths behind this. But the interesting thing is the stuff that happens on a physical level, and that's what I'm gonna be talking about. So now, let's finally get into this. The first phenomenon that we're going to be looking at is known as the Hall Effect. Now, it's named after a dude called Hall. It's got nothing to do with corridors and landings or anything like that. Let's start by imagining a very thin strip of metal shaped like this. And let's also remember that metal, just like other forms of matter, are made up of atoms. However, specifically in metals, the electrons in the outer shells of these atoms that form the metal are actually free to move around. They form what's known as the electron C because electrons are flowing and moving around all the way around the metal. And so what this essentially means is that electrons being charged particles can actually flow, let's say all in one direction through the metal and carry a current. That's what a current is. It's a flow of charged particles. So now that we've established that, let's imagine that we connect a battery or a cell to our strip of metal in this way. And the battery or cell connected in this particular orientation causes electrons to flow in that strip of metal in this direction. And so we have what we said earlier would be a current. We have a flow of charged particles, in this case electrons, in one direction through the metal. So far so good, right? We've just used our strip of metal as a glorified wire in an electrical circuit. But now what happens if we take our entire circuit and place it inside a magnetic field pointing in this direction? In other words, the North Pole is here and the South Pole is here. If you wanna know a little bit more about magnetic fields, by the way, check out my videos on Maxwell's equations. They deal with everything electricity and magnetism. So check those out if you haven't seen them already. But anyway, so we've taken our metallic strip and placed it in a magnetic field. We said earlier we placed the whole circuit in the field, but to simplify things, let's just imagine that the magnetic field only exists so that it passes through the metallic strip. Now, what a magnetic field does to an already moving charge is to exert a force on it. So let's imagine that we look at one of the electrons moving through our metallic strip. Now this electron, as we already know, is the charged particle and it's moving because it's part of the current flow. It's part of a group of charged particles flowing in a certain direction which means that we have all we need in order for the magnetic field to exert a force on it. And specifically speaking, a magnetic field exerts a force on a moving charge in a direction that's perpendicular to, or at right angles to, both the direction of the flow of charge and the magnetic field. And so if electrons are flowing in a particular direction, we've got the magnetic field perpendicular to that, then the force exerted is going to cause the electrons to move in this direction. So basically what we had earlier was a straight flow of electrons from one side to the other, and we're talking about a flow along the length of the strip. And now, because of the magnetic field, the electrons are going to be moving not in that direction anymore, but they're gonna be curving towards one of the sides of the strip. And essentially the magnetic field pulls all of these electrons, or quite a lot of these electrons, toward one end of the strip, leaving that end negatively charged because electrons are negatively charged particles, and the other end of the strip, because of a deficit of electrons, is going to be left positively charged. Well, this kind of distribution of charge along the width of the strip actually generates a voltage across the width of the strip. Think about it, all a voltage is, is a measure of how a charged particle placed at a particular point would move 
based on electric forces acting on it. And a simpler way to think about this voltage generated across the width of the strip is that there are lots of negatively charged particles on one end and lots of positive charges on the other end. And so if we were to place, let's say, a random positive charge in the middle of the strip, then it would move away from the positive end and towards the negative end. That's what a voltage is. It causes a charged particle to move due to electrostatic attraction and repulsion. Remember, by the way, that opposite charges attract and like charges repel. So positive charges repel positive charges and negative charges attract positive charges and so on and so forth. And so what we've discussed so far is basically the Hall effect. It's this generation of a voltage across the width of our strip of metal when placing a strip of metal that already carries a current in a magnetic field perpendicular to the direction of that current. Basically, due to the force exerted by the magnetic field on the charges in the current flow, the charges move towards one end and therefore generate a voltage across the width of our strip. That's the Hall effect. By the way, just for notation's sake, we say that if current was originally flowing in this direction, then the direction in which the voltage is formed is the transverse direction. And therefore we can measure the transverse voltage generated for any particular strength of magnetic field that we use. Also, if we recall something that's known as Ohm's law, we can recall that this tells us that the voltage, let's say across a component in a circuit, is equal to the current flowing through that component multiplied by the resistance of that component. And we can rearrange this so that the resistance of that particular component is equal to the voltage across that component divided by the current through it. And in this case, we're gonna be using some very special values. The current value that we're going to be using was the current initially when it was traveling straight across the strip. And the voltage value is going to be the transverse voltage that we've measured, because that then will give us a resistance value known as the Hall resistance, because it's the Hall effect. Anyway, so let's now imagine that we keep our initial current exactly the same. We do not change anything about it. It's the same value all the way throughout an experiment that we're just about to conduct. We also keep the strip of metal exactly the same. We do nothing to it whatsoever. What we do change is the strength of the magnetic field. We start with a very weak magnetic field and then we increase its strength so that it gets stronger and stronger. And as we increase the strength of the magnetic field, what we can do is to measure how the whole conductance changes with the strength of the magnetic field. And remember that a voltage is just a measure of how a charged particle placed in that particular region wants to move. The larger the voltage, the more it will accelerate. It's kind of like a ball rolling down a steeper hill. You get the idea. But anyway, so what we would expect is as we increase the strength of the magnetic field, the force exerted by the magnetic field on each one of the electrons gets stronger and stronger. And so, once again, what we're expecting is that the voltage gets larger as we increase the strength of the magnetic field. We're expecting more and more electrons to be pulled more and more strongly to the negative end as the strength of the magnetic field increases, which leaves more and more positive charges on the opposite side of the strip. And so what we have is a much, much more positive side and a much, much more negative side than before when the strength of the magnetic field was not so high and only a few electrons are pulled to one side, leaving only a few positive charges on the other side. Which means that if we're expecting the whole voltage to keep increasing as we increase the strength of the magnetic field, and we're keeping the current exactly the same, then we're expecting the whole resistance to increase as well, every time we increase the strength of the magnetic field. Basically, if we were to plot a graph, then this is what we would expect to see. On the horizontal axis, we've got the magnetic field strength, and on the vertical axis, we've got the whole resistance, or whole voltage. Doesn't matter which you plot, because they're both proportional to each other. In this particular case, because we're keeping the current constant. Anyway, so what we're expecting is as the magnetic field strength increases, the whole resistance increases also. And that is exactly what we see for small magnetic field strengths. Because as soon as we increase the magnetic field strength, as soon as we work with strong, strong magnetic fields, this happens. In other words, the plot that I showed you earlier of what we'd expect to see is just this tiny portion of the graph. And then we get flat lines in this graph and things move up and then it gets flat again and it moves up and it gets like, this is really weird. You know, we thought it was going to be a simple case of increase the strength of the magnetic field, the force on the charges increases, therefore the voltage increases. And so the whole resistance increases. We thought it was going to be that simple. We thought we we're going to see a linear relationship. And to be fair, like I said, we do for small magnetic fields, but then it gets really weird. So what exactly is going on here? Well, the answer to this question is, as often is the case, quantum mechanics. The logic that we used to try and figure out what we'd expect to see when we increase the magnetic field strength was based on classical physics. Classical physics is the kind of physics that scientists used all the way up until the discovery of quantum mechanics, and it's stuff that makes a lot of sense to us. It's stuff that agrees with common sense quite a lot of the time, 
but unfortunately it doesn't reflect exactly how the universe works. There are countless experiments that have been done that show the predictions of classical mechanics to be incorrect and the predictions of quantum mechanics to be correct. Or in other words, experimental evidence is king. If it doesn't happen in our real universe, then it's not really that useful to us. Don't get me wrong, classical physics is still useful in many situations, but a much better description of the universe is quantum mechanics. Anyway, it, that's a bit of a tangent. Let's go back to what we were talking about. Now, what actually happens in order to give us this graph, what actually happens in our strip of metal, is quite complicated, and the quantum physics behind it is quite complicated as well. So I'll try and describe it to you by using an analogy, and I'll try and show you the kind of thinking we need to have in order to understand what actually happens. Now, this analogy is going to be based on atoms, and more specifically, the internal structure of atoms. Many of you may have seen in high school physics and chemistry that atoms are made up of protons, neutrons and electrons. We've already discussed the electrons when we were discussing our metallic strip. But in addition to this, protons and neutrons are located at the center of the atom in a region known as the nucleus. But that's not relevant to us right now. What we care about is the structure of electrons around the nucleus. Now, many of you might know that electrons can only exist very specific distances away from the nucleus. These are known as electron shells or orbitals. However, interestingly, electrons can move from one shell to another by means of either absorbing or emitting what's known as a photon, a little particle of light. Anyway, so electrons can move from one shell to another, and if they're moving to a shell that's further away from the nucleus, then the energy of the electron increases because shells closer to the nucleus are lower in energy, they're more stable, and so moving to a shell that's further away from the nucleus means an increase in energy of the electron. Where does this energy come from? Well, the electron absorbs a photon of light. That photon itself is energy because light waves are just propagating energy and then when this photon is absorbed the electron can move up to the shell above or another shell that's further up however the important thing is that the photon must be of a very very specific energy this energy of the photon corresponds to the difference in energies between the energy of the electron in the lower shell and the energy of the electron in the upper shell. In other words the electron needs to get that very specific amount of energy in order to get up to the next shell too much and too little, and the electron will not transition. The photon will continue on its way, not interacting with the electron, and the electron will stay exactly where it was. So we can imagine an experiment where we've got photons initially of a very low energy being fired towards our electron, and then we increase their energy and see what happens. What we're gonna see is that very low energy photons come in and you know nothing happens, the electron doesn't jump up to the energy level because the energy of these photons is not quite right. And then at a very specific energy, the electron does jump up to the higher energy level. And then if we bring an electron back to the lower energy level and we keep increasing the energy, then even photons with too high energy do not cause the electron to jump up to the next shell. Because like I said, the energy needs to be exactly right. Keep this in mind, this is really important for in a minute, but just as a quick finisher to what we've just been discussing, electrons can also move down from a higher energy level to a lower energy level, or higher shell to a lower shell, by releasing a photon of that very specific energy, the energy that's the difference between the energy of an electron here in the higher shell and the energy of the electron here in the lower shell. Anyway, so coming back to the important thing, we saw that as we increase the energy of the photon, nothing happened until the energy was just right. And then when the energy was just right, the electron transitioned from the lower shell to the higher shell. And then coming back to an electron in the lower shell, we kept increasing the energy so that the energy was larger than the difference between the energies of the two shells and still, nothing happened. In reality, things are a little bit more complicated, but we won't go into that here. The idea is what's important, because it's this kind of thinking that will help us understand what's going on with our little metallic strip. As we increase the magnetic field, it takes us up to the next value of the resistance, and then, even though we're increasing the magnetic field, it stays exactly the same, exactly the same, exactly the same, exactly the same, and then it jumps up to the next value of the resistance, just like the electrons jumping between energy levels. We needed the photons to be of the exact right energy, and increasing this energy a little bit didn't make any difference. We just needed those specific values. This is exactly what we're seeing in our little metallic strip. In this region, nothing is happening. We're increasing the magnetic field, but it's not quite right. At this point, the magnetic field becomes exactly what we need to bring us up to the next resistance value, and then increasing the magnetic field once again does nothing, and then at this point it takes us up to the next one, and so on and so forth. Now this effect, and in particular this graph, is a trademark of what's known as the quantum Hall effect. I'm not going to go into too much more detail here because this video is not about the quantum Hall effect or even the Hall effect. This video is about what I think is the straightest line ever measured. And this is that straight line, or this one, or this one, or this one. 
because along those flat lines, the values of the Hall resistance are identical to each other for different magnetic fields to within one part in a billion. Like they are as close as they can get. And I don't know if I've stressed upon you just how mind-blowingly amazing that is. So let me even clarify to you that these values, these amazingly close values, were got with a sample that was dirty and sort of not broken, but just sort of damaged and sort of ugly looking. It wasn't a perfectly polished, you know, perfectly flat surface that was supposed to be in very specific conditions. The experiment was almost done in a very throwaway way. The idea is that often when you do experiments, things are very, very messy. The real world, the real universe is extremely messy compared to what we see in the beautiful maths that's written down in all our theories. We expect things to go a very specific way, but when we take readings and results, there's a lot of errors that go into it. Measurement errors, human errors, random errors, systematic errors that we haven't considered, so on and so forth, that result in our experimental readings being sort of not so clean, not as clean as we expect them to be anyway. And so that's why this particular set of results is so amazing. Regardless of how nicely we've set up our experiment and how cleanly we've polished our sample, our little metallic strip, we're getting these values accurate to within one part in one billion. If we draw a line straight through them, that is about as straight a line as we can get. And another interesting thing is that the value of the Hall resistance at all of these plateaus is equal to some simple fraction multiplied by constants of nature. The Planck constant, which is a fundamental constant in quantum mechanics, and the charge on an electron. And this is quite cool as well. It's not just some random numbers, some random resistances. They are very specific fractions multiplied by some very specific constants of nature. And that's quite a cool thing as well. But anyway, so that's just an aside. The main thing is that these lines are so, so straight. And therefore, for that reason, these lines are my nomination for the straightest lines ever measured. Like I said, if you've got any better examples, then chuck them down in the comments below. I really definitely want to read about them because this is the kind of stuff that I enjoy. <laughs> and if you want to know a bit more about the Hall effect, check out the Hall effect on Wikipedia. If you're feeling brave, check out the quantum Hall effect, which is even more complicated. And if you really want to either blow your mind or just read a Wikipedia page and not understand a word it says, then check out what's known as the integer quantum Hall effect and the fractional quantum Hall effect. And lastly, I just want to quickly mention that I love making videos like this because a lot of these topics are stuff that I struggled with when I was at university. My Maxwell's equations videos were made because I remember thinking while I was at university, these equations are quite challenging. I haven't fully got the grasp of them. And having made those videos, I know that I haven't got the grasp of them, but I understand more about them. And the same is true for this particular video. Quantum Hall effect, or even the, the basic Hall effect, is something that I never had time to get my head around whilst I was studying at uni. It was just something that was mentioned briefly and we moved on and there were exam questions about it and I would avoid them every single time. So I like that I've had the time now to go back and revise what the Hall Effect and what the Quantum Hall Effect are about, which is why I'm so grateful I get to make videos like this and you guys seem to enjoy watching them. I appreciate that very much. So yeah, thank you so much to all of you who sit through my ramblings about physics. It allows me to do something I really love and yeah, with that being said, I am going to end this video here. It's long enough, I'll come back with my weekly question of the week soon enough, but thank you so much for watching. Couple of quick announcements. I've started vlogging again, but this time on IGTV. So if you don't already, follow me on Instagram at pathvlogs. And I've been working on some music as well. Something really exciting is happening. I'm working with somebody who is just phenomenal. I'm not gonna say too much about it here because it's gonna take a while for the music to even be released. Um, but suffice to say, I'm working on stuff that I'm really, really excited about. And with all of that being said, that's all of my updates for now. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you very, very soon. Bye-bye-bye-bye.